I'm Sweet Tea. I work at uh, Meta, uh, primarily on the ButterFS file system for the past two years. Before that, I was at Red Hat. Uh, I really enjoy working on the Linux kernel, and today I want to tell you all about encrypted ButterFS subvolumes, which is a project that I have spent a bit of my time at Meta on. Um, it's one of the most exciting new features in ButterFS, in my humble opinion, uh, in several years. Uh, and I'm really excited uh, that all of you felt like coming and hearing about it. Um, so, uh, to, as an overview, first I'll be talking a little bit about ButterFS and where encrypted ButterFS subvolumes actually are. Uh, then I'll be talking a bunch about the technical aspects of the work, um, talking about the differences between different file systems and uh, built-in disk encryption, future goals for the work, and then practical usage of the encryption, uh, encrypted subvolumes. Uh, so, yeah, um, with that, uh, I'm curious, how many of y'all use ButterFS? So about two thirds, very cool, very cool. And how many of y'all have contributed to the Linux kernel? Cool, so about one third, very cool, very cool, awesome. Um, so uh, a general sort of overview of ButterFS. Um, ButterFS is, in my humble opinion, an advanced file system. Uh, it's not necessarily a judgment on quality, just a judgment on the number of features that it has. Uh, so ButterFS, uh, so a normal file system, you know, you've got a disk and you use it in your file system and it provides files and directories. Glorious, worked well 10 years ago, still works pretty well for most use cases, but uh, advanced file systems have a couple of new features that uh, can lead to data efficiency, uh, or isolatability, which older file systems don't have. Uh, one of these features is called ref linking or reference linking. It's where you uh, take a chunk of data and you uh, tell the file system that it's actually part of two different files. Uh, so it allows you to sort of deduplicate your data. Um, Subvolumes are another great feature. Instead of having just one uh, disk that you mount and provides you with your whole file system, with subvolumes, you can choose which directory tree to mount at any given point. So for instance, you could have every user on your machine can have a different user subvolume containing their personal user data and only that personal user data so that uh, even without, the, uh, without file permissions, that user can't read any other user's data because that other user's data isn't mounted at all, just completely unavailable. Along with subvolumes, snapshots are a very cool feature. Snapshots allow you to take a subvolume and grab a snapshot of how the files in that subvolume appear at any given moment in time. So this is really great for backups. It allows you to take a snapshot of exactly a point in time and save it elsewhere so you can easily roll back uh, package install or a change in your code that you turn out not to have wanted after all. Um, so snapshots are pretty exciting. Uh, ButterFS also features checksumming of your data. You know, disks are glorious and disks are very reliable, but at meta scale, sometimes disks go bad. So uh, we have checksumming built into ButterFS so that we notice when data on disk has gone bad. Uh, and it's also useful for your own personal computers. Uh, so that you know when to dig out the backups. Um, so overall, I would call ButterFS, XFS, and BcacheFS the advanced file systems in the Linux kernel. It's possible that I just don't know how wonderful and advanced other file systems are. Um, XFS doesn't have subvolumes and snapshots, but it's got ref linking, which is pretty cool. ButterFS has all of these, and my understanding is that BcacheFS has all of these things too. Um, However, for a long time, ButterFS has not had a good encryption story. Now, we've got disk-based encryption using Device Mapper, using DMCrypt, uh, which is the underlying technology behind uh, Lux. Um, and Lux is pretty standard on most distributions these days. However, there are, s uh, when you're using ButterFS on top of a Lux device, it works great, but it encrypts everything. And because ButterFS copies data every time you write, 
there can be a little bit of extra I.O., which can slow you down a little bit. Um, the way that encryption for file systems is usually done in the Linux kernel would have meant that we would need to give up reflinking and checksumming in the past. However, um, as of a couple of years ago, uh, we uh, started working on per subvolume encryption, where each subvolume has its own encryption key, which also works particularly well for uh, per user subvolumes. Uh, that way, every user can have their own key, which would be great. Um, now, at this point is the part where I awkwardly admit that when I submitted this talk, uh, it seemed like this work was about to go into the Linux kernel, and it would be widely available and easy to use everywhere by the time I gave this talk six months later. However, uh, how many of uh, those of you who've worked with the Linux kernel before know that sometimes it can be a little difficult to uh, successfully come to a joint understanding and get your code reviewed and into the kernel. So this is the part where I awkwardly say this stuff isn't actually in the kernel yet. It's just a patch set on a mailing list, a branch on GitHub, and it's not actually easy to use yet. But one more kernel release is what I've been saying for the past six months. So, uh, <laughs> In any case, um, there, have, uh, there were some technical challenges to add encryption to ButterFS that I think are particularly interesting and illustrate uh, some of the complexities of ButterFS compared to other file systems which maybe aren't, uh, don't have those advanced file systems features that I was talking about. Um, so in, in the Linux kernel, there's a sort of a library uh, called fscrypt that provides encryption facilities to file systems. Um, it provides, uh, so there's an encryption area of the Linux kernel, and then fscrypt is the glue that connects your file system with all the different options available for encryption in the kernel. Uh, it makes it easy to use. Um, it's commonly used on Android, as I understand it, so probably at least half of you are currently using fscrypt in your pockets. Um, X4, F2FS, Ceph, and UbiFS are currently, uh, ha currently have integrated fscrypt, so they all support encryption with this interface. Um, but fscrypt has been around for a while, and so it's oriented at file systems that don't have those advanced features I was talking about. So they have one key per directory tree, and you can't have multiple keys in a directory tree. This is a little awkward for ButterFS, given that you might want to have subvolumes inside of subvolumes inside of subvolumes. Uh, stack them all up, uh, nest them all over, um, but fscrypt doesn't currently support that. Um, fscrypt also allows you to delete files without actually having the key. This is a really important feature because otherwise you couldn't get your space back unless you reformatted your system, which I don't know about you, but I don't like reformatting my systems. Anybody, anybody actually like reformatting? <laughs> of course, there are some cantankerous people in the world. <laughs> Keep calm and reinstall. <laughs> um, so the big advantage of using fscrypt instead of a Lux uh, disk encryption uh, is that fscrypt allows you to only encrypt your personal data. So there are different threat models that you could treat, uh, that you could think about for your data, right? There's the threat model where everything about your data is important. Even just the size of your file could give away some information about it. And, you know, that's a perfectly valid way of thinking about it. That's a perfectly valid threat model to use. And in that universe, it is a good idea to use full disk encryption so you absolutely don't leak any information about your files at all. However, for me and for some other folks in the world, perhaps even a lot of other folks in the world, we really only care about our data being read. We don't really care about other people knowing how big our files are. There can be a lot of files with a given size. Um, as long as you can't read the data or the file name, what's the harm? So fscrypt allows you, uh, fscrypt file systems just encrypt file names and data, uh, which allows for added, uh, uh, which re uh, reduces the amount of stuff that needs encryption, which means you spend less CPU on your encryption. Um, 
cool. Um, so I don't know how many of y'all have worked in the Linux kernel enough to know about inodes. How many of you have heard of inodes? Okay, so about, about three quarters. Very cool. So the idea for FScript is that the in-kernel inode structure uh, embeds a, an FScript information uh, structure that gets stored on disk. Uh, basically, uh, that information structure allows the FScript library to encrypt uh, data in files based on where that data is in the file uh, and which file it's in. Now, you can probably already see where this is going and why this uh, would have prevented, uh, this would have forced us to give up the ref linking because if you've got data in two different files and it's encrypted with this scheme, then on one side you're trying to decrypt it with this file info and on this file you're trying to encrypt it with this file info, which is different. Um, so without making changes to FScript, we couldn't uh, ref link uh, encrypted data together, which would be a bit awkward. Um, also, as I mentioned, ButterFS likes to use nested subvolumes, which makes uh, it sort of important to have different keys at different points in the directory tree. Uh, and uh, finally, it's difficult to do checksumming if the file system uh, never actually can access the encrypted data. Uh, which is the direction that FScript is moving in. Uh, so this is a bit awkward and requires a bit of changes to FScript and figuring out exactly what those changes to FScript should be has been a bit of a project. Um, the overall vision for ButterFS encryption is that instead of encrypting data based on what file it's in, you encrypt based on what extent it's in. Now, if you've worked with file systems, you might uh, know that uh, file systems usually store the information for a file uh, in some actual extent on the disk, uh, which serves as a sort of indirection layer um, to allow uh, moving the data around or more efficiently packing the data. Uh, so the idea uh, that we came up with is to store the, ex uh, the FScript information alongside those extents instead of those inodes. That way, if you've got two files pointing at the same extent by ref linking, uh, they both su uh, can successfully decrypt the data given that the uh, key is uh, the uh, additional information uh, combined with the key in order to decrypt it is stored right there. Um, this does mean that it takes more metadata space than for older file systems, but it means that we can ref link. So uh, by and large for ButterFS, it's a win to do it this way. Um, we uh, sent up the first version of these patches with one design back all the way in October of 21. Um, we, we were using uh, a minimal set of data stored with each extent uh, and it was pretty decent. It had some security risks and so as it should have been, it was, uh, I, I worked on this a lot and eventually we came to an understanding that the security holes were too bad. Uh, and it was a bad idea. Um, in November 22, we sent out a second design that was almost entirely, uh, that was largely my work um, using, uh, trying to pull down the inode information directly onto the disk. Um, this was s elegant in some respects and inelegant in other respects. And so the maintainer uh, decided that this approach wasn't working either. Um, and so uh, in September of 23, which was about when the call for proposals for this conference was due. Um, we came up with a third design. Um, my uh, team lead, Joseph Blachik, um, and the maintainer worked together to come up with a design that everybody agreed on. Um, and uh, so my patches were amended greatly and s uh, new versions of the patch that were sent upstream. Um, unfortunately, it means that uh, we can't have nested subvolumes right now, but we can one day in the future. Um, the effort was to try to get it into the kernel sooner and then add this additional feature later. And unfortunately, even though it seemed like it was one release away for the past six months, it still hasn't gone upstream. I'm still really excited about it and I'm still uh, confident that it will uh, happen in the near future. 
um, but it hasn't happened yet. Um, so the idea here is that we're storing sort of a, where we're storing both information along with the inode and also information down with the extent. Uh, so uh, the inode is storing what key we're using. Um, so if two inodes want to uplink together, they have to use the same key. Um, this does uh, provide some advantages when it comes to security. Um, uh, so that two users who happen to have the same data don't end up using uh, the two subvolumes that have the same key don't end up uh, leaking information if only one of them is mounted. Um, so uh, it's uh, got some merits. Uh, it does somewhat restrict uh, what encryption options you can use. Um, and we're up to version five coming out soon on the mailing list and it still hasn't gotten in, but hopefully one more release uh, <laughs> uh, eventually. Um, but this addresses all of the difficulties that I talked about. Uh, it doesn't allow changing the keys yet. And uh, you might conceive of wanting to change the keys. Um, let's say you have a subvolume uh, that serves as the base for all of your user home directories. Uh, you might want to take a snapshot of that and then give each user their own key and either re-encrypt or use the old key to access the common data across all of the user uh, directories. Unfortunately, we don't have support for that yet, but it's possible to add it fairly easily. Um, we also came up with a way to uh, uh, check some of the encrypted data, which uh, is very important for BetterFS uh, so that you can tell if your data has gotten encrypted on disk. Um, and by using all three elements uh, to encrypt instead of just two elements, it allows replinking and will eventually allow replinking between uh, any number of inodes. Um, so it's got a lot of potential and I'm really excited for it to go upstream soon. Uh, and yeah, um, there's still some work to be done here. Um, DecacheFS is the wave of the future, uh, according to some people. How many of y'all have played with DecacheFS? So about a quarter, very cool. Um, DecacheFS has some great features and I've really enjoyed playing with it. I really enjoy the uh, there being more file systems with subvolume features in the kernel so that we can build common interfaces and uh, spread the love of subvolumes wider. Um, uh, but vcacheFS doesn't actually use FS scripts right now. Um, it also only has one encryption key per file system and everything is encrypted. You can't delete stuff if you lose the key, which is a little awkward. Uh, however, there are some features that it has that FSCrypt doesn't yet have. Um, FSCrypt does not currently allow you to have authenticated encryption. So authenticated encryption is sort of like a more advanced form of checksumming. Um, you take your data, you take a key, uh, and you get out your encrypted data plus some authentication tag that uh, you can only derive if you have the correct key. So it leaks absolutely no information. Well, a checksum even of the could either be spoofed if it's a checksum of encrypted data, or you could yeah, find out what that data is if it's a checksum of unencrypted data. So authenticated encryption nicely solves these problems by only allowing you to verify the data's correctness if you already have the encryption key. Um, so this is a very cool feature. I think vcacheFS is doing wonderful work in using it, but it does mean there are fewer options for encryption algorithm and different companies, different countries have different requirements for encryption algorithm. Um, so there are some, there's some trade-offs between vcacheFS and ButterFS. Uh, Another option that you've probably heard of that I talked a little bit about was Lux. Uh, so Lux does allow uh, authenticated encryption also if you use the DM integrity target also. Um, it still only allows one encryption key per file system or block device, obviously. Everything's encrypted, um, which again means you can't delete stuff if you don't have the key. 
Um, um, but it does allow you to do authenticated encryption, uh, as I mentioned, and it allows you to change the encryption key, which is a really cool feature. Uh, it means that if you lose your key, you can say this key is no longer valid and not lose all of your data. You can also re-encrypt with some newer and fancier encryption algorithm if your existing encryption algorithm turns out to be insecure now. I believe Lux is, yes. I, what? Um, I believe the technology is technology-ing. <laughs> so, technology is pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> yes, very exciting. <laughs> <laughs> um, so how many of y'all have had uh, an exciting experience with displays on your computers? <laughs> cool. And how many of you have deleted something that you didn't want to delete? <laughs> and how many of you have reformatted a disk that you didn't mean to reformat? <laughs> uh, good times, good times. Uh, have any of y'all actually used the Lux option to re-encrypt your data? Very cool, very cool. It's a lot more than I expected. Very cool, very cool. Uh, and how often have you changed your keys? <laughs> yeah, it, it is a bit of a pain, right? You either need to keep both keys around or you need to uh, spend the CPU time and the IO time to read all your data and re-encrypt it. So it is a bit of a pain. Um, technology, different technology. <laughs> so it goes. Yes. Uh, so the question is, does this have anything along the lines of access control lists? Um, so. My understanding is that um, ACLs are more or less distinct. Um, so um, this revolves around uh, having an entire file system directory that is only visible uh, to uh, a user if they successfully load their key. So when they load their key, however, the entire set of file system features is available. Um, so if you've got your ACLs stored, as you normally would with a file system, those would uh, be available now that you've decrypted it. Yes, so that's uh, so the scenario being described is basically every combination of two of th uh, of some number of three users wanting to access different files, being able to access different files. Um, so there are some files that only A and B should be able to see, some files only B and C should be able to see, some only A and C. Oh. Ah, I see. Um, it, it's definitely, definitely. So the idea is that pharmaceutical companies sometimes collaborate and sometimes don't want to collaborate. Uh, and we don't want to leak information between uh, companies that don't want to collaborate. <laughs> indeed, indeed. Um, so unfortunately, I can't come, I have not thought about this very much. Um, you would need eight partitions with Lux. Um, with a ButterFS-based approach, you could still have eight sub-volumes um, for every combination here. Um, uh, that is a good point. Um, so 
while I don't have a good solution other than a subvolume for every pair that went to uh, every set that went to collaborate, um, with a Lux-based partitioning scheme, you have to decide how much space you're going to use for each of those partitions at formatting time. With a ButterFS subvolume, everything is being stored in the same set of backing disks, uh, so it's a lot more flexible. And if you delete some space uh, from one shared subvolume, now all the rest of the subvolumes can use that newly freed up space. Um, I can, my understanding is that there's some uh, technology to take one single encryption key and split it up into many encryption keys. Um, I'm not a cryptographer, so don't ask me how. <laughs> uh, but um, such a technology could easily be layered on top of using ButterFS subvolumes uh, to provide exactly the sort of uh, shared access controls that we were talking about, I believe. Um, one, one key unlocks all the subvolumes that you're supposed to have access to, um, each with their own different key. Um, and that, I believe, allows the sort of, uh, some subsets of users can access each different subvolume. Yep, um, it is the case that right now you can use normal file system partitions and that's a reasonable solution in the current world, but definitely encrypted subvolumes could be used in this fashion also. Um, so it looks like my technology is properly technologying now. Um, so I will uh, charge forward with the rest of my slides. Um, yeah, so we were talking about Lux. It's great, it encrypts everything. Sometimes you don't need everything encrypted. Sometimes you care about performance more than you care about encrypting everything. Um, so that's why FScript might be a different choice for different uh, applications than Lux. Um, so we talked about those two options and how uh, key changes is a very cool feature. And I definitely hope to use it, uh, hope to integrate that into ButterFS encryption uh, one day soon. So there's a Fedora proposal to maybe use ButterFS encryption one day. Um, the idea is that uh, some laptop OEMs have requested a way to load a encrypted image onto a disk that they're, uh, for a laptop that they're sending to a company. Common encrypted disk, that way everything is encrypted. Um, then the company can set a new key for uh, their own personal packages that they want to install on the computer, uh, and then sets up their home directory templates, and then the user can set their own new key for the home directory, possibly with some sort of escrow so that both the company and the user can read the user's data because users sometimes lose their keys and really didn't mean to. Uh, it's probably a bad idea if, if your user loses their key and loses their past three months of work stored on their computer. Um, so this directly requires key changing. You start with an encrypted image. Uh, you probably want to change the key on that encrypted image on a per company basis. Then the company wants to change that so the OEM can't access it. Then the user wants to change their key so that anybody else from the same company uh, can't access their data without having the full company key, etc. Um, the only bit of meta information in this talk is that we once had a vision where we would do something similar, uh, and we may want to do this one day in the future, where we install an unencrypted package into a subvolume. Um, we usually run services inside of a container inside of a subvolume uh, for isolation purposes. Um, so if we install an unencrypted set of binaries, uh, then we could change the key on the subvolume so that everything written by that service uh, to disk is encrypted. No chance of somebody forgetting to call the encryption service before writing to disk. Um, however, we've decided to go with a different solution for now, but there, but our FS encryption is a feature that has wide applicability and we may find an application for it in the future or change technologies. Um, 
and finally, uh, there are some companies that just believe in changing your password every so often, and this would allow you to change the password or key on your subvolume, while still, uh, w which can't currently be done with the ButterFS encryption proposal as it is now. Um, so that's like the technical overview of how uh, this is all put together uh, and why we care about it. Um, now we come to the part where I really wanted to have a demo, but uh, I am a running Mac OS and my virtual machines broke with an update this morning, so that's a bit awkward. Uh, but <laughs> I mean, it's what I get for using OSX for kernel development, right? Uh, also true. <laughs> uh, so, um, this is, uh, if you download the patch set off of mailing list, build a kernel, uh, and interact with the keys uh, directly with the FS scripts tool, uh, you can set up encrypted subvolumes uh, right now. Obviously, it's still the early days, so uh, if you're an early adopter, we appreciate your efforts and hope that you don't lose any data. Um, there, there is definitely a, a stabilization period while we don't know of any bugs. You know, everybody knows how software without bugs uh, doesn't exist. So, uh, yeah. Um, but it, whoops, it shouldn't, uh, once it lands upstream in the kernel, it should just be a matter of installing the new kernel, installing the FScript tool that interacts with file systems, um, and then a very small amount of changes to your system D services in order to ask, uh, in order to make it ask for a ButterFS key instead of just a Lux key, um, and that will load it into the kernel keyring, and then ButterFS will unlock the master, the, the like uh, root subvolume, uh, assuming it's encrypted with that key, uh, and then it should be easy to integrate uh, potentially with systemd homedir or some other uh, login service in order to unlock your home directory as part of logging in. Um, so once this actually lands in the kernel, there's very little user space changes needed to use it. And I definitely have a hope that one day all of the Fedora users in the room uh, will be uh, able to pick between Lux or ButterFS encryption when you install, or perhaps BcacheFS encryption. They all have their merits. Um, so yeah, how many of y'all actually use Fedora? Okay, uh, a lot of Debian Ubuntu users? A fair number, a fair number. Um, SUSE? Cool. Now I'm really curious about what the rest of you use. <laughs> <laughs> of course, <laughs> of course. NixOS is also an excellent choice, um, so yeah. It's true, and I, I really like NixOS, so I don't know why I didn't think of it. <laughs> um, cool. Um, so, unfortunately, that wraps up my talk about upcoming, real soon now, features in ButterFS. Um, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> uh, and we have a bit of time for questions, so I see a question back there. Uh, so my understanding is that there's a big limitation with like FS script type things where the metadata remains unencrypted. Has there been has there been any thoughts to adding in something like ComposeFS or EROFS to maintain the metadata so you can have both encrypted metadata as well as the per file encryption? Oh, uh, so uh, you're asking about the possibility of encrypting metadata, uh, sort of like bcacheFS does. Um, so that's quite possible. Um, for ButterFS specifically, it's very difficult uh, because we store all of the file system's metadata in a single metadata tree. Uh, so it's not obvious what key you would use to encrypt each file, so each block of data in that tree. Uh, if you tried to encrypt each individual file metadata item, um, those items are so small that there's too much. Uh, there could be too much of a risk of brute force 
attacks on your teeth, I believe. Um, I could imagine a world where you used an overlay FS type thing uh, and stored metadata, uh, stored all the changes to your subvolume in a different encrypted file on ButterFS, and I suppose that could work. Yeah. Um, so that's a good idea. Uh, it should be easy to integrate above the ButterFS subvolume uh, encryption support uh, once it lands. Yes. Yeah, you, uh, you mentioned there was a restriction on having nested subvolumes with different keys. Mm -hmm. Does that, that doesn't prevent me from having two subvolumes and just mounting them in a parent directory relationship in a regular file system hierarchy. What, like, so what, what were the implications of not having this restriction? Like, what does that prevent us from being able to do? Oh, right. So for nested subvolumes, the idea is that you have a directory tree, and then at some point in the directory tree, you have another subvolume that looks like a directory. Um, so for FSCrypt right now, you can perfectly well have two different directory trees that don't overlap at all, that each have their own encryption key. However, um, if you had your one directory tree and then you tried to access the new subvolume that looked like a normal directory, the keys would mismatch and you would get an error. You'd have to mount them separately in different parts of your file system hierarchy. So hopefully we can uh, loosen that restriction. At some point, it shouldn't be very technically difficult uh, to do that. I just, we, we haven't done it yet. Uh, question behind you. Um, well, my concern is ransomware. I missed a little bit of the talk at the beginning. Um, so we were hit for ransomware, and I, the company I work paid for it, okay? Um, however, everybody went crazy, and it's been a crazy year securing everything. So the question is, um, can this be done? So I understand that this is done at the volume level uh, or a sub volumes level. And I'm not an expert on BTRFS. I, I run everything on ZFS, but all my servers run BTRFS. So the question is whether the application itself is the only uh, entity that can encrypt and decrypt the data, not the user. I see. So, it so the only uh, entity capable of decrypting or encrypt if if we if we get hacked this entity should not be able to encrypt my disk basically or uh, but i guess if he has access he can do anything he wants but i don't know in, in the ransomware scenario how can this help i unfortunately don't think i follow your question in enough details to figure out a solution for it right now let's connect offline Sorry. The encry exactly, yeah, I see. Yeah, your point. Your point is right. It's very, very well taken. There is no way. Okay. Can group owned volumes be opened and unlocked by multiple users? Uh, yes. If you use some sort of key distribution scheme um, or key derivation scheme so that multiple users all have the same key, they can all unlock a shared subvolume uh, using that key. I, I think my answer there is uh, a derivation of your question, so thank you very much. <laughs> Are there more questions about? Cool, cool. So I thank all of y'all for coming to my talk. Uh, I am sorry I don't have uh, actual packages and Fedora repositories to tell you to install right now to get encryption, but I'm excited for that day to happen real soon now, and I hope all of you uh, try out ButterFS encryption one day, and uh, thank you for learning about it today.